Hi, everyone. This is Elizabeth Roaring with the National Sea Grant Program. Um, I want to thank you for joining us for our fifth installment in our webinar series where we're highlighting our NOAA Sea Grant liaisons. These liaisons integrate NOAA and NOAA-funded research and its end users' uh, end users needs by connecting Sea Grant Network and its expertise with NOAA-funded science, products, and services. Um, if you are interested in learning more about these programs, these positions, please feel free to get in touch with me, elizabeth.roaring at noaa.gov. Um, and as my Sea Grant colleagues know, I've been threatening this for close to six months now. We should be having a competition out soon. Um, we're going to be looking for two more uh, liaison positions, and uh, we welcome our NOAA colleagues to work with the Sea Grant programs to see if there are any that would be of interest. With that, I would love to introduce Dr. Carrie Garrison Laney. She is the Tsunami Hazard Specialist uh, with Washington Sea Grant at the University of Washington and a liaison to the Pacific Marine Environmental Lab's NOAA Center for Tsunami Research in Seattle. Carrie's work includes research on tsunami geology and tsunami mo modeling. She also works collaboratively. Sorry. She also works collaboratively with the Washington Department of Natural Resources and the Washington Emergency Management Division, working on outreach materials and giving outreach trainings and talks. So with that, please uh, welcome Dr. Carrie Garrison Laney. Take it away. Great. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. Um, I'm so pleased to be able to um, share some of my um, experiences and observations from um, a trip I took last November um, to Japan um, to some areas that were um, devastated um, in 2011 in the um, Tohoku earthquake and also um, to meet with some international collaborators uh, working on a lot of the same things I work on. And so, uh, but, but before I get into talking about um, Japan, I wanted to give a kind of a brief overview of my position and some of the other things I work on. So um, my title is across the top there. It's a long, uh, it's a long title. Um, but before I talk about what I do, I wanted to. Um, highlight the fact that um, my position is actually shared, it's a 50% shared position with um, Meg Chadsey, um, Ocean Acidification Specialist, who kicked off this um, Sea Grant Liaison Series um, last year. And um, we're, we, she calls us the two-headed beast. <laughs> and so I just say together we make one. <laughs> Okay, so my uh, my work kind of falls into two categories, um, research and, and outreach. And um, I'll be showing you some examples of both of these just briefly um, before I talk about Japan. But um, my research includes, um, like Elizabeth mentioned, work on uh, paleo tsunami deposits and also establishing ages for these and um, identifying potential sources. Um, which also can include um, testing those with site-specific um, tsunami source modeling from various places. Um, I've also done a little bit of work on site-specific tsunami modeling, um, incorporating different sea level rise scenarios to see how sea level rise will affect tsunami hazards in the future. I've got a um, collaboration right now with Tohoku University on tsunami sediment, sediment transport at uh, one of my sites here in Washington. And we're really excited about um, being able to continue that work to some other um, places um, in Washington and along Cascadia because um, tsunamis move a lot of sediment around and it's, it's important to have an idea of uh, what those um, impacts might be for us in the future. And then um, I'm just starting work on two different NSF coastlines and people projects. Um, one of them is uh, setting up a, a research network um, and the other uh, Cascadia um, research network. And the other one is uh, 
working on creating um, geonarratives, um, sort of the, the history of Cascadia and also subduction zone science and trying to really capture what we, uh, what we know pretty well and where the uncertainties are. I also do um, quite a bit of uh, out, what I've called outreach or advisory. I've got, um, just started this year, a uh, working on a maritime guidance pilot project in Washington state. And we're trying to put together a, sequence, a series of products to help uh, the Port of Bellingham um, know how to respond in a tsunami. And it's the first of what should be several um, projects in that vein. Um, I also, as Elizabeth mentioned, um, do a lot of collaborative outreach with um, Washington Emergency Management Division and the Geological Survey. Um, I, I also, oops, sorry about that. Um, I also um, am connected to researchers at the University of Washington. Uh, the U.S. Geological Survey has an office, um, has a group at the uh, University of Washington, and um, also people who work on tsunami hazards research and also emergency management from um, all along the West Coast and Canada and Japan. And in um, last August, I joined the NTHMP, which is National Tsunami Hazard Mitigation Program, and I joined the mapping and modeling subgroup. So there are activities involved um, with going, attending those meetings and kind of carrying out some of the objectives of that group. Um, so just a brief kind of encapsulation of some of those things I just talked about. Um, one place I've done quite a bit of work is Discovery Bay. And you can see up here in the upper right, Discovery Bay is a bay um, along the Strait of Juan de Fuca in, in Washington. And this is uh, Tsunami Central for Washington State. There are um, at least nine tsunami deposits, which you can see um, on the left. Uh, the, it's these kind of lighter layers of uh, very fine sand and silt in um, tidal marsh deposits. And so this this is a this hole I this is a pit I I dug in the marsh, and you can't really dig much further down because it thing fills up with water. But you can core down, and um, there's all these tsunami deposits. But one big question we have is: Are these from Cascadia only, or do we have other sources for these? Um, in the, on the map, you can see where the Cascadia subduction zone is offshore, and this is the tsunami source we are most concerned about, but we also have all these other faults that are crisscrossing the Puget Lowland, and we know that um, some of these um, have uh, tsunami jet potential, and we know the Seattle Fault uh, created a tsunami about a thousand years ago, um, and some of these other faults we suspect um, are capable of producing tsunamis and are still considered active. Um, some of the work I've done has really focused on narrowing the ages of these tsunami deposits. So this plot on the lower right here is showing uh, probability density functions for radiocarbon ages for the, the youngest six tsunami deposits at Discovery Bay. And some of them aren't dated very well. Um, and that just requires a lot of work, um, a lot of work collecting specimens that are really going to produce the best radiocarbon age. Um, bed two is got a question mark there because it's unclear whether that's from Cascadia or another source. Its radiocarbon age doesn't quite match up with anything um, that we know about happening on Cascadia. And there's no evidence out on the outer coast for an event of, uh, of Washington for an event of that age. Um, but if this is interesting to you, get in touch with me because I can talk about this for a long time. But for now, I'm going to move on and talk about some of the other things I work on. Um, these are some images from um, the Washington Tsunami Roadshow, which is a multi-day 
outreach um, event that I work on um, with Washington Emergency Management Division, Washington Geological Survey, um, partners from the Weather Service. And we go around to towns um, all out on the outer Pacific coast of Washington and talk to them about uh, tsunami sources and why do we have tsunamis and how do we know we have them and um, what are warnings, how are warnings generated and what do the different kinds of warnings mean and what actions should people take before, during, and after tsunamis. Um, because of so much variation in the Washington coastline you saw in that previous slide that our waterways, and not just Pacific Coast, but also um, the Puget Sound, all the Salish Sea coastline, what we all call um, the inner coast of Washington. Uh, we've actually now divided the roadshow into two groups, uh, Pacific Coast and inner coast. And so starting this year, we're going to have two separate roadshows um, just because the needs in those two different areas are, are pretty different. Um, another thing that um, I worked on um, with Marie Ebley um, at the NOAA Center for Sony Research was uh, creating uh, this is a front and back of a one pager um, that sort of highlights. Um, a lot of the work that uh, Tsunami Research Center does and also kind of puts it into context of the greater uh, NOAA tsunami um, effort. And um, this, was, this was important to create because there wasn't really something that you could just hand to a visitor or an elected official saying, this is what this, is what this group does and this is the benefit this group brings. Um, another thing Marie and I worked on was a redesign of um, tsunami.noaa.gov, um, which was an existing website, was um, very out of date and had lots of broken links. And what this website does is uh, tries to organize uh, the whole, the greater NOAA tsunami program, which includes lots of other pieces, um, not just um, what NCTR does. Um, but if anyone who's ever spent time looking through all of the many, many uh, NOAA tsunami related websites has certainly found that there's lots and lots of information there and um, kind of knowing how all the pieces fit together um, can be can be challenging even for those who uh, work in the, in the tsunami world. So this website was an attempt to kind of organize some of that information. And so it's a launching point to, for further information where you can go. Um, I also mentioned the um, maritime guidance work that I'm just now starting with. And this is a cover slide from a talk um, that I gave with Alex Dolce Mascolo from the Washington Geological Survey. And this is a, a still from tsunami animation produced by the Washington Geological Survey uh, using tsunami modeling output um, from NCTR. And uh, this, this shows, this really kind of captures the, um, the complexity of the Washington waterways and why we're working on um, maritime guidance and um, also why we split into two different uh, you know, groups for outreach focus. Um, I should mention that I also participate in a tsunami work groups, um, which we've also divided into a Pacific Coast and um, Inner Coast because the, the concerns and folks of two groups are quite different. Uh, but we're the beginning pilot project is going to be up here in um, Bellingham, Bellingham Bay, and. Um, this is a Cascadia tsunami. You can see, like, kind of starting to move into the strait here. Uh, but we also have to be concerned with tsunamis, um, particularly from Alaska, and also potential tsunamis generated um, on some of our crustal faults in the lowland. Um, this is this is probably uh, this is a pilot study um, creating, <clears throat> excuse me, a series of. Uh, products that will be the basis for um, a lot more work that we do 
um, advising the maritime community um, because there are different sources. Um, there are, there's different amounts of time before the tsunami affects particular areas. So in Bellingham, they've got an hour and 15 minutes or so before a Cascadia tsunami will reach them. Uh, but if there's an Alaska tsunami on the way, they'll have over three hours to react. And so, um, and knowing what the tsunami is going to do in all these different places requires a really high resolution modeling. So, um, we're working to try to give people the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the best products that we can possibly give them. Now onto the trip to Japan. Um, this trip came about because um, last year um, at the close of a big NSF funded um, M9 project, which was a University of Washington project that brought together uh, people who did Cascadia related research in, in many different fields. It was basically looking at what would be the impact of a magnitude nine earthquake to buildings, uh, coastal areas, tsunami, landslides, liquefaction, you know, everything. Um, at the end of that meeting, uh, we hosted an international workshop. Um, to bring together uh, people from different places, mostly um, Americans and Japanese and Chileans, um, to kind of start some collaboration between the University of Washington and those groups. And um, I took them out into the mud uh, to look at tsunami deposits, and they, they loved it. They had a lot of fun. And um, as a result, they invited us to go to Japan uh, last November. Uh, we visited them um, at the ERIDIS, which stands for the International Research Institute of Disaster Science, uh, which is at Tohoku University, and uh, that's, that's in Sendai. Sendai is northeast of Tokyo, and uh, Sendai, the Sendai Plain was uh, really impacted by the tsunami in 2011. Um, but Iridus was founded uh, right after uh, the, the Tohoku earthquake, and um, it really focused on reducing future impacts of disasters. Um, we attended two different conferences um, during this trip. One was the World BOSI Forum, uh, which is a forum uh, that that is collaborating in the spirit of um, kind of learning from past disasters to prevent um, loss of life and um, improve resiliency moving forward. And um, this was the second World BOSI Forum. Um, and I think they'll plan, they plan to continue these every two years and um, have them in different locations. So um, BOSI is a, it's a Japanese word that, that kind of has, captures this idea that you can prevent future disasters, um, or, or not, you can't prevent the disasters, but you can prevent the human impact of um, disasters with uh, learning from what's happened in the past. Um, and so, bow prevention, sai disaster, prevent of disaster. Um, um, some of the Americans wanted to call it the Bonsai Forum, but uh, it was not Bonsai, it was Bosai. During the World Bosai Forum, uh, they had an exhibition hall, which was pretty amazing. Uh, these are just a couple of uh, the exhibits from that. Um, it was it was um, sort of an amazing array of, of high-tech solutions to uh, post-disaster situations. And um, on the right, you can see this box here, this hexagonal box that um, allows you to produce this entire uh, toilet uh, in the aftermath of a disaster, but also um, equipment for generating clean water, electricity, uh, drone capabilities, food, 
um, anything uh, anything that you can think of high tech uh, was was represented there. Um, in addition to World Bosai Forum, there was also another conference um, called the AI West Conference, which um, looks like it might have gotten chopped off, but it's it's a collaboration that started um, in 2000. Um, it, this the whole concept started in 2005 um, after the great Indonesian um, earthquake and tsunami, and then. Um, Hope University joined up um, with Indonesian partners in uh, 2005. And since then, uh, they've been meeting annually. Um, so it's mostly groups from um, Indonesia and Thailand, um, but also, and the Japanese, and also um, people from Australia and New Zealand attended. So this was the first year any Americans uh, attended this conference, I think. Um, and uh, this was great because it, this was a lot, we, we got to see a lot of the same people that visited us um, the previous uh, March. Uh, this is the lobby of Iridis uh, during one of the breaks in the conference and there's lots of uh, really amazing displays of some of the work that they do. And my favorite uh, was this disaster mitigation kimono, which is a kimono that's printed with all kinds, all the information that you need to know to um, how to respond and prepare for um, earthquake and tsunami disasters. But um, maybe a kimono might not be the most applicable uh, to us in the U.S., but they also had lots of other products that um, we're thinking about adopting and maybe um, copying. Um, one of them, uh, they had a few different bandanas with lots of good information printed on them. And uh, it really kind of, seeing the uh, quality and variety of outreach materials that Eridus has developed uh, really kind of inspired a lot of us to um, think about what kinds of things we can start to work on to use on, um, on our coast here. This is showing uh, part of the Sendai Plain um, following the earthquake um, in March 11th, 2011. And this is this red area shows um, the inundation um, of, by the tsunami on the Sendai Plain, and it the scale here is showing it um, five kilometers um, inundation. And there was also there was also further, even up to 10 kilometers in some places up um, river channels. And a lot of you know plenty about this event, um, but just some statistics for you. Um, it was the fourth largest earthquake ever recorded in the history of seismology, but the largest in Japan. Um, many deaths, mostly from tsunami. Uh, the maximum tsunami height measured was over 40 meters um, in Miyaku. 10 kilometers um, tsunami traveled inland of uh, rivers. Um, definitely the costliest disaster ever in history. Um, over 200 billion U.S. dollars worth. Um, and then, of course, the Fukushima nuclear disaster. Uh, this was uh, considered to be a thousand year tsunami and uh, tsunami deposits left behind this tsunami, by this tsunami uh, look very similar. They're very similar in their extent, geographic extent, and also thickness to deposits attributed um, to the Jogan earthquake in the year 869 AD. Um, so, uh, there was definitely geologic evidence that this area could experience um, significant tsunami inundation, um, although uh, the official hazard forecasts um, for a lot of the Tohoku coast um, did not predict a tsunami of, of this size. One of the places uh, that we went to um, as part of um, our field trips that Tohoku University put together for us uh, was a trip to one of the elementary schools in the Sendai Plain, um, Arahama Elementary School. And 
Uh, this is the school. It was um, inundated during the tsunami. Um, there's a sign here that shows the height of the water here. And now it is um, preserved as a museum. Um, this is a photo taken uh, during the tsunami showing uh, people um, had evacuated to the roof, all the school children and uh, many people in the community surrounding the school evacuated to the roof. And uh, they were on the roof partly because of uh, the decision of, of Principal Kawamura, who a couple of years previously had made the decision instead of evacuating to their brand new gymnasium um, to have everyone go up to the roof. And they, they were up on the roof for 24 hours following the tsunami. They, washed, they watched their entire neighborhood um, be swept away and their gymnasium was also swept away. Um, so this this place is you know while while it represents uh, you know tremendous devastation um, there was there was a the, the good part about uh, having this evacuation plan and carrying out this plan was that um, everyone survived. Um, this is the inside of the first level now so they've reinforced the building and now it's a tsunami and now it's a museum to the to the tsunami but they've left parts of it um, as is and uh, this is a, just another view from the outside on the right is an image showing a reconstruction of what the community looked like before the tsunami they got residents uh, that lived there to come in and actually create, recreate this three-dimensional map um, what the neighborhood area and the area looked like uh, before the tsunami. These are some images on the left. Uh, that's a photo of debris that was inside the school following the tsunami. On the center is the ubiquitous Japanese tsunami evacuation sign that you see all over the place. And then on the right, some damage to the exterior of the building. Now, uh, from the second level, uh, you can look out to where the ocean is, and you'll see that uh, there's some, a few trees standing. Um, if you are standing closer to them, you'll notice that all those limbs are uh, ripped off up to a certain level that shows how high the tsunami was. And also, I wanted to point out that this was actually a fairly dense forest before the tsunami. Now we're going to go look at uh, this area right here, Tsunami Memorial is, and uh, we were just right here at Arahama. This is a view from Google Earth, looks a little, looks a little pixelated, but it's showing um, the Tsunami Memorial and the seawall, the new seawall, and uh, here is the Tsunami Memorial on the left, and the height of the memorial shows the height of the water. And then on the right here, uh, this is uh, Randy Levesque, the tsunami modeler from the University of Washington, and he's standing on the seawall, which was, was raised to a higher level than it had been. And here's the Tsunami Memorial over here on the right. And the Tsunami Memorial is still taller then six foot four Randy on top of newly raised seawall. So the idea uh, for the new seawall is that it will protect against uh, more common, more frequent, smaller tsunamis, but still wouldn't be tall enough to protect um, against a tsunami like they had in 2011. So after, after the tsunami in 2011, um, there was development of um, what's called the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction. And I don't have time to really uh, talk about that in any detail right now, um, but it was basically a big plan to um, how to respond, how to rebuild, how to um, increase resilience uh, moving forward. And part of um, the Build Back Better um, 
rebuilding, you can see in Sendai, it's, uh, it's underway right now. Um, from this cross section, so we were just uh, over here at what they're calling coastal embankment, or we would call seawall. Um, you can see some of the plans that um, they're putting into um, effect. So the largest scale tsunami is going to penetrate um, inland pretty far, um, but smaller ones won't go quite as far. And so between the coastal embankment uh, disaster prevention forest, which they're replanting that forest to try to dissipate um, tsunami energy. You can see lots of small trees everywhere that have been newly planted. They've also created evacuation hills. They're building a elevated road. And um, there are also evacuation facilities uh, sprinkled all around the Sendai Plain. And let's look at this in map view. So on the right, you can see this is some of the uh, build back better Sendai um, in action here. There is this area which will likely be inundated in most tsunami events, this disaster risk area. And what they did there was they basically relocated anyone who um, lived in that area to far to areas further inland and you can trace that um, with the orange arrows that show some of the areas where people got relocated to. Um, these relocations were, uh, were mandatory and also um, financially subsidized uh, by the Japanese government. Um, along the coast, they built um, these green circles are evacuation hills. Um, this is a cross section of an evacuation hill. They utilize concrete from uh, debris left over. Uh, tsunami sediment. And also one thing that we found kind of mind-boggling was uh, mountain sand. They're actually blasting mountains further inland and trucking the sediment down into the Sendai area and also other parts along the Tohoku coast uh, to raise up the ground level. Um, another thing I wanted to point out here with all these purple triangles are evacuation facilities. This is the elevated road that I mentioned, and along the elevated road, there are places where there are stairs that you can evacuate up to it. So I'll show you some pictures of, of some of this um, in action here. Um, this is one of the evacuation towers that were built. Um, many of them have an enclosed area, which is full of um, supplies, and things that you might need. Um, one thing that happened, after the tsunami, some people who evacuated and got away from the tsunami actually died of exposure um, overnight because it was very cold, it was snowing, and um, people who, especially people who had been caught up in the water, uh, were, were in really bad shape um, after the tsunami. So the idea was to get a lot of these evacuation facilities full of supplies to keep people um, comfortable and also um, fed sanitation products and, and many things like that. This is, uh, this is what you see all around the Sendai Plain. Um, they're building up the ground level and there's heavy equipment everywhere. And this is you know, eight and a half years after the event. So the work that's being done there is still um, definitely in progress. And um, we, all the Americans were completely surprised and kind of overwhelmed by the scale of some of the projects that were going on. Um, it's pretty, pretty amazing. Um, this is a residential area that is now six meters higher than it used to be. So on the left, these are new uh, residents with that, where the property is subsidized by the government. And um, the building on the right is part of the emergency um, housing for those who lost their homes. Um, more heavy equipment, uh, dump trucks full of sediment. This is a view from uh, top of the Arahama Elementary School, and on the right you can see uh, where the raised road is being built and the ground level is being um, increased. 
Um, this is a Google Earth view of the raised road. So it's not um, it's not open yet. Well, it wasn't open when we were there in November, um, but eventually will be open. It'll serve as a, a barrier, also a place to escape. And I mentioned that there are stairs in many places that allow people to, to run up to the top there. Um, another site that uh, we visited was um, not, I should, I should just back up and say that our Hama Elementary School, um, was, it was devastating for the people who survived to watch their neighborhood be destroyed, um, but they did all survive. But then we went to um, Okawa Elementary School, uh, which is northeast of uh, where our Hama School is. And uh, there, it was a very different story, really tragic situation. So Akala Elementary School is, um, this is about four kilometers inland um, from the ocean along the Kitakami River. And the school site is uh, located um, near this hill, I'll show you in the next picture, and also uh, a new bridge. And here's the school site. Now the school was completely um, inundated by the tsunami. You can see the proximity to hillside that was not inundated. And it's a, it's a really, it's kind of a, it's hard to understand what happened there. Um, this book, the picture, the little inset picture is a book about um, this event, this school being inundated. Um, most of the students and, mo and uh, the most of the students that were still there and the teachers that were still there died. Uh, many parents came and picked up their kids and took them away. Um, but the kids and teachers who stayed um, for a variety of reasons um, did not begin to evacuate until 50 minutes after the earthquake. And um, there were uh, tsunami warnings coming in. Uh, there were many people who were trying to convince um, the assistant principal who was in charge that day because the principal wasn't there that they needed to evacuate to higher ground. Um, but for whatever reason, he um, like psychologically did not accept that there was really a hazard. Um, part of it might be because they had had a tsunami warning just two days before, uh, one of the four shocks of the event, and that didn't turn into anything. And so, um, but part of it too was just a, sort of a feeling that they weren't in any danger. When you're at the site there, you definitely don't even feel like you're anywhere near the ocean. Um, so it was a, it was a really difficult place to visit. Um, and it was a really difficult story to hear about, um, but I'd like to think that we can take something away from um, from what happened, the tragedy that happened there, um, and just keep keep remembering to instill in you know in, in outreach activities, uh, having a good plan um, and practicing it to prevent something like this from happening. Um, another site we visited, uh, which was northeast of Okawa Elementary School, was um, the town of Minami Sanriku. And um, this is what Mina all the low lying areas of Minami Sanriku looked like oh, after the tsunami. And I've um, circled a couple of buildings here that we'll look at pictures of. Um, the first one is, is this one in the center here. And this is um, the Takano Kaiken Event Center. There was an event going on during, uh, during the earthquake. There was about uh, over 300 senior citizens were in the event center for an event. And um, once the earthquake happened, a lot of people wanted to leave the building and they wanted to evacuate. Um, but the person who was in charge of, of hazards for the building and for the event um, got the other staff to physically keep people from leaving. And um, they were able to save everyone. Everyone had to go up to the roof. The tsunami um, inundated all the way up to the fourth floor. And you can see debris um, hanging out of the, of the upper windows. 
and also two dogs were saved. So that's really good. These are some, uh, this is a photo from outside the building now. Now this building is a ruin, it's still standing. They're gonna leave it standing, uh, but it's not a museum. And up here you can see uh, the inundation level on the building. Um, nearby, uh, where that is, uh, this is a photo on a sign in a new uh, shopping area, which is basically catering to uh, tourists passing through this area, um, showing what the area looked like after the tsunami. And um, this building right here, the Crisis Management Department building, was completely inundated. And I tried to translate some of this. Um, but this is the crisis management building um, a, few, a couple of years after, I think this was from 2013 or 2014, but this is what's left of the building. And then um, nearby, behind, behind, in the area uh, behind where this building is over here, they're building a um, memorial park. And this is a sign showing what the plans of the Memorial Park are going to look like. It's going to include, <clears throat> excuse me, um, this Memorial Park that's also an, an evacuation hill and uh, just a place of remembrance. Now, the disaster building, the crisis management building, this is what it looks like now. Um, so the river has been um, completely hardened with these um, new levees, and we saw this all over, uh, all up and down the coastline uh, with not just seawalls, but also levees built along the river. And this is kind of gives you an idea of how much higher they're raising uh, so sort of the ground level here. This building, um, the only people that were in this building that survived were people who actually um, climbed up the cell phone tower here. And then you can see the um, Memorial Park and evacuation hill in the background. This is another view of um, some of the levees being built um, along the Uwata River. That was also in the image we just saw. Um, the scale of the engineering projects in some of these communities is, is pretty hard to, to take in. It's, um, it's incredible. And, and we know billions of dollars have been um, poured into these communities. And some of these projects that have been done um, were not necessarily um, agreed upon by uh, the citizens. Um, so there's definitely some lessons to be learned there. This is another view from this um, shopping area that shows the Memorial Park being built in the background and the evacuation hill. And this is a, a Easter Island statue that's a replacement um, from Chile, a replacement of a gift from Chile that was um, given to them originally in 1960 following the Chilean tsunami, which caused a couple of fatalities in Minami San Riku. But um, because their Easter Island statue was washed away in the tsunami, uh, they got a new one here in the Memorial Park. And then this inset is just showing uh, while we were there, we all got this emergency alert um, and we were all scared, but because it's in Japanese, we couldn't read it. But um, we had some Japanese uh, speakers with us, luckily, who told us, oh, it's just a test. So uh, that was that was a I guess that's a good it's a good idea to have these in multiple languages. Okay, now back to uh, the Sendai Plain. Um, this is this is the northernmost part of the Sendai Plain, and every pin here is showing some evacuation something, um, whether it's a building that's been designated as evacuation building and, and built to standard to withstand tsunami, or an evacuation tower, or evacuation hill, or elevated road. Um, they've definitely got this place um, covered. And then, and I also wanted to note that the um, scale on this is um, four kilometers. Now here's part of the coast of Washington showing all of our evacuation facilities, but there's only one. 
There's only one vertical evacuation uh, facility in uh, the entire uh, the entire continent of North America. So this is just showing part of Southwest Washington, Grays Harbor. Uh, this is tsunami inundation modeling um, by NCTR of a, of a large Cascadia event. And one thing to take away from this is that these peninsulas are entirely um, overwashed by tsunami. There's only a few areas of higher ground that are not inundated. And you can see by the scale here, we're talking uh, up to 60, almost 60 or um, almost 60 feet in some places. And um, the scale on this map is different than the last map. This is a 10 kilometer scale. So you can see that the distances required by people to travel to get out of inundation zone is too far for them to make it out. Um, in along the coast here, people might have 15 or 20 minutes before a tsunami arrives following an earthquake. And so um, vertical evacuation is going to be really critical uh, to save lives here. And um, aside from just the year-round residents here, we also get a huge influx of tourists in the summer months. So an extra 100,000 people might be in this area um, in the summer months. And so educating not just the year-round residents, but also visitors what to do in the event of tsunami is a big challenge. It's a really big challenge, especially um, in, in Washington. Okay, so to start to wrap things up here, um, made a kind of a comparison of some of the actions taken in Japan and whether they apply to the US. Um, so some of the things that I think are not going to work here in the US, um, prohibiting uh, construction in certain places or subsidizing relocation um, of, of people out of inundation zones. Probably not going to work too well in the U.S. Um, there, we do have some tribes in Washington that have either um, started to move um, or are planning to move up to higher ground if they have places available to go. Um, I don't think we are very likely to uh, build seawalls or um, harden our uh, riverbanks um, with levees. And we also um, don't have our schools built to the seismic standards that Japan has. Um, Japan, Japanese schools are um, built to very high seismic standards, and they are places where people have been taught to go to evacuate. And we certainly don't have that um, in the U.S. In fact, most of many of the schools in Washington are uh, likely to have uh, failure, structural failures in an earthquake, let alone uh, withstand a tsunami. Um, evacuation structures. I'd like to see uh, the coast of Washington uh, have this kind of density that the coast of uh, Sendai Plain has in terms of evacuation structures. Um, one has been built, the you Acosta know, Elementary School. Uh, one has been funded, Shoalwater Bay Tribe has one funded that um, they are either going to begin construction really soon or they already have, and then um, others to follow, we hope. And, um, Education and outreach. I think we, I think we've done a good job, but it's sort of an ongoing. We need to keep on doing that um, ongoing effort, and then practicing evacuation drills. I think we need to keep doing that more. So we've got some challenges. Uh, we've got cultural challenges. Like I've had this happen over and over again, where someone will come up to me at the end of a talk and say, "Well, I've lived here my whole life, and so did my parents, and we've never had a tsunami, so why should I worry about this?" Uh, so we've got work to do. And um, a lot of these coastal communities in Washington um, have uh, are financially depressed. And so there's a lot of competition for their resources and also um, capacity, um, whether or not anyone has the time to be, to be able to put the time into things like going after funding for vertical evacuation. And then um, our both side knowledge to take away from this, um, things that, things that uh, you know, observations from stories uh, we heard or things that I've read, um, it really helped when people either had experience
experience or had a relative who had experience with a tsunami. And there was countless stories of, you know, people who said, oh, gr my grandmother told me they had to go up to this point on the hill. So that's where I went. Um, people who survived had plans and practiced them. Um, and people who survived didn't delay evacuating. Uh, people who waited around or went down into the inundation zone to, to take, you know, grab their belongings or go pick up a relative, a lot of times those people did not make it out. Um, people who survived didn't underestimate the hazard. And they get, they get tsunamis fairly regularly in Japan and they're not all, you know, a lot of them are small and so when you hear tsunami, you might think, oh, well, we've been through that and it wasn't so bad. Um, vertical evacuation was critical. And um, finally, the money, there was a big influx of money into a lot of these devastated areas, but how to spend it was not really agreed upon. Um, so I think we need, I think it's really important for communities to have plans uh, what to do when some of that money starts coming in, how to spend it. And I know we're getting short on time, um, but there's lots more work to do. I think I've touched on a lot of these things already during the talk. So with that, I will stop and um, see if there are any questions. Okay, thank you so much, Carrie. Um, this is Erin uh, from the No Central Library. And um, I do not see any questions so far, but someone submitted a comment. They say, humbling report, grateful to Carrie for the in-depth information and the opportunity to attend. Great, thank you. This was, um, I've been studying um, tsunami deposits for over 20 years, and I feel like, um, I feel like I learned a lot and took a lot away um, from this trip. And um, yeah, it, it's, it, was, it, was, it was really, in a lot of ways, um, one of the most influential things I've ever done um, was going and, and seeing, seeing the recovery and talking to people about, about it. It gave me lots of ideas for how, uh, how we can kind of use some of their experience to uh, improve our outcomes in the future. Okay, and then we do have some questions trickling in now. So um, someone says, can you speak more to the impacts of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant incident and what lessons and considerations we can learn from that? Uh, yes, so I did not get to go um, to Fukushima myself, but there were a couple of uh, people from University of Washington who went to have a tour. They didn't get to go into the plant, um, but the, the main, uh, I think the underestimation of what the tsunami might look like, how high the tsunami might be, uh, was a really big problem um, for Fukushima. Their seawall was not nearly high enough to prevent um, the tsunami from coming in. And, um, and then they also, there was also some issues with um, how they had set up uh, their power systems in the basement of the plant. Um, so I, I could refer you um, to either Dan Abramson at University of Washington um, or Lan Nagayan um, from University of Washington because they went and they were able to, you know, kind of get into some of the more in-depth questions. So email me if you wish, and I realize I didn't put my email address anywhere on here, um, but I'm pretty easy to find on the Washington Sea Grant webpage. Okay, great. Um, another question we had, does Japan have a regular source of funding for mitigating impacts? Um, we we had a lot of questions for um, our Japanese colleagues about um, money and what one thing. Well, we were overwhelmed with how much money is being spent in these areas that were just devastated, and and we had questions about uh, you know where did this where did the money come from? I think the majority of the money um, came from the government, uh, and we also had questions about um, why is all of this protective and preventative stuff being built in an area that just had their large event 
and why not focus more of that in areas that are um, expected um, to have a large event? And you know, we get we get a lot of different answers about you know where does the money come from and who decides what to do and where to do it. And it, it's my my takeaway from that is a lot of it was just like direct awards from the government to contractors who went in and, and did what they wanted to, um, often without a lot of input from the, the local communities. Um, so I, I don't think we'll see that. I don't think, I don't think the coastal areas of the U.S. are going to see that level of input of, of federal money following an event. But I do think it's important for them to realize that money will come in and, and have ideas for how to, how to spend it. Uh, another question we have here, what's your opinion about the pros and cons of channelizing rivers? <laughs> um, we, some, of the, some of the tsunami modelers <laughs> looked at those channelized rivers with hardened banks and wondered um, if that might actually enhance uh, tsunami in <laughs> penetration into the interior. Um, these are I, I don't have the answer to those questions. I think there's a lot of problems with doing that. I think it could it could probably um, focus tsunami energy and but then there's also this whole host of other environmental problems um, and not sediment not being able to move around in the environment there. So um, I don't I'm not actually convinced that that's a, a good idea, um, but most of the places that were dev really devastated, um, not most, but a fair number of them were um, upriver channels. So I do understand, um, you know, kind of wanting to have a feeling of, well, that we're protected from that. That won't happen again. Um, but probably not something we would ever want to do in the Pacific Northwest. Another question we have Did warning? times vary for the impacted areas? Um, I know that warnings warnings um, were received in some places and then in, in other places where um, power was out, they did not receive warnings. But people were um, getting warnings in other ways, not just, um, so you're not, you know, not just firings. But people were getting warnings in other ways. And there are, um, from Ocala Elementary School, there were a couple of um, civil servants who had a vehicle with a um, microphone on the, or a loudspeaker on the top who drove around and, you know, told people verbally, tsunami is coming, get to high ground. Um, and even though they drove past um, the Okawa Elementary School and saw all the students and teachers standing outside the building, not 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 evacuating. Um, that still didn't have an impact. Um, but uh, so they de they definitely didn't get they didn't get their warnings through all of the ways that they might have gotten them um, in that location. But um, but still warnings were coming through in other ways. Um, you know, over radios and um, emergency, emergency like the emergency warning <laughs> that we got when we were visiting the Nami Sandy group. Okay, and I think we have time for one more question. So, um, Carrie mentioned that some of the communities didn't approve of the measures that have been implemented after the earthquake and tsunami. Is there any indication on how that feedback was received or acted upon, if at all? Um, I think, I. I can't, that's a that's a really complicated issue because there was a lot of uh, var variation from community to community. Um, I know that um, there was a lot of people in the Nami San Rico that were not pleased or did not like um, the plans that were implemented there. And I know that um, there was pushback in some places that resulted in some compromises, uh, like this, the the um, City of Ketsunuma, which is a little bit further north of Minami San Riku, um, actually have their seawall has the highway on top of it. So it's not quite as um, obvious of a, of a feature in the landscape. 
Uh, but that's there's there's a lot to dig into um, to answer that question, and um, and maybe maybe that's a separate <laughs> maybe that's a separate webinar. Um, but contact me if you wish, and I can point you to some more resources to to help answer that question more fully. So that's uh, all the questions that we have for now. So I can turn things back over to you, Elizabeth. Oh, okay. And um, all right. So um, if there was uh, nothing else, um, then uh, Carrie, I thank you very much for this presentation. Uh, and um, thank you, everyone who attended. Yes, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Carrie.